Starting your own gunsmithing shop can be a huge undertaking, but can also be one of the most satisfying things you've done. In this video, we're gonna break it down A to Z. Gavin Gu here from ultimatereloader.com. I'm here with Rick Kasner. Thanks for joining us, Rick. Yep. Rick is from the SDI, and Rick has also worked in the gunsmithing industry. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you've done? Okay, yeah, so I started out, well, back in 2009, I went to gunsmithing school, and then after that I went into the industry as far as small mom and pop stores. I actually working my way up at the gun counter in a regular gun mm -hmm. store, and then small mom and pop shops, gunsmithing shops, worked also at a machine gun manufacturer. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, <laughs> I did the M2, M60, things oh, like that. Oh, yeah. So it was a lot of fun. I love machine guns. Yeah, <laughs> it was fun. But um, but yeah, so then later went on to get a, a my higher education, bachelor's, master's, mm -hmm. and then that's what ultimately worked me into the higher education world. And Instructing gunsmithing, yeah. now being a part of building curriculum. Yeah. That yeah. sounds like a really, really cool job. <laughs> yeah, so that that's what ultimately brought mm -hmm. me to Sonoran Desert Institute. And yeah, so now I'm designing the curriculum that we give to our students, helping design that. There's another, there's a whole team doing it, but mm -hmm. I'm one of the team. So. Yep, and I've recently partnered with the Sonoran Desert Institute, and you're gonna wanna check out the SDI overview video that Rick and I just did. If you're interested in the program, sdi.edu. If you wanna talk to someone, you can call 480-999-4767. Okay, so getting into the meat of this video. I have recently gotten my FFL 07, my SOT, and am opening up a gunsmithing shop here in our town. And it has been such a learning experience <laughs> and such a process. I wanted to lay this all out and talk about all the different things that you're gonna to need to consider. Now this does relate to SDI as well because SDI offers a lot of the training and the knowledge that they can equip you with to go into this eyes wide open, right? And basically there's two different options within your gunsmithing career track. You can work for someone else or you can work for yourself. So what are the pros and cons of both? <laughs> I, I can speak from having never owned my own, as, own business as far as on the FFL side. Mm -hmm. I've owned my own business, but not needing an FFL. Yes. So it was in okay. firearms instruction. Okay. So I've always on the FFL side been an employee. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you the benefit of that is you're not dealing with the other things we'll talk about in sure. this, but the insurance and you know, your your pay your regular rent or your leasing mm -hmm. or whatever, and you get that regular check. Yes. You know it's coming. Yes, that so. is very good. And also you're not liable, right? Mm -hmm. If you make a mistake, it's liable. It's basically the business owner that's gonna be stuck trying to figure out what to do. And that could be something as simple as we have an A and D books entry that's incorrect and the ATF has is performing an unplanned inspection and someone's got to an answer to it, right? Yeah. Uh, that's stuff that you you know have to think about as a business owner. Now, what I like about being a business owner is uh, it's a risk reward thing. You know, if I think there's a lot of money to be made in the firearms industry. I've learned about all these interesting opportunities from building custom rifles to starting your own Saracote shop. I mean, there's it's a, it's a world of opportunity. Right, but uh, there's also significant risk there. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're gonna just buy machine shop equipment and buy all the tools and rent the space and all that, you know, you're, you're probably talking 100K plus oh, yeah. commitment up front. Now you could do that with cash, you could do that with lending. Yeah, there's, there's a lot here to think about. So what I think is interesting about this though is if you're working for a shop, you're gonna get a lot of great knowledge on the job. You're gonna learn about the ATF. You're gonna lear learn about state laws, right? If you've sold guns over the counter, background checks and record keeping and, and, and all that stuff. And if you're a gunsmith, you're gonna learn from people and be able to learn on customer guns and all that. Now, that might lead you to want to start your own home shop. You know, it's like, I wanna work from home. I want to live where I want to live and I wanna work directly with my customers. So that could lead to, kind of the, the smallest scope, you know, starting your own gunsmith shop, which would be a home shop. Well, and you you also 
you'll probably see gaps in the in the needs for a gunsmith in certain communities that don't mm -hmm. yet have them. So mm -hmm. you say, okay, I've already gained this experience at this gunsmith shop that I've been working at. Yep. But now I'm going to go take that 20 miles north. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, and they, it's, it's a sizable community. They don't have a gunsmith. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to go start my own thing. I know what I'm doing. Maybe yeah. I need to know a little bit more on the business side, but as far as gunsmithing, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing with the books because I've been running that. Yep. So it's very, very good to start out as an employee and get that experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, get as much experience as your employer will let you. And hopefully you have an employer that will let you have that scope to be able to get, gain that experience. But then you can branch out and do your own Yeah, thing. I really wish that I could have done that. Because when it comes to things like understanding the ATF regulations and rulings, and you know, managing A&D books, your acquisitions and your dispositions, it's intimidating. And I have had to reach out to FFL Connects on Facebook, really great group to join if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Drink from the fire hose. I've had a couple friends that are FFLs, so that's been, been really great. So the, the downside of the home shop is there's gonna be a different perception. You know, if you're not a brick and mortar store, you might not get taken as seriously. And then also there's increasing scrutiny coming down from the ATF in terms of them wanting to potentially close down home FFLs and all that. So just understand you know, the problem domain and understand the pros and cons and what's gonna be needed. Uh, where I'm at is the sole prop brick and mortar shop. We have a store location. It is our ATF location and I'm paying rent monthly down there. Uh, what's great down there is we have fiber optic internet, which we don't have up here. Yeah. So having two locations is really great. And, and we're hoping here shortly to have this sort of precision rifle oriented gunsmithing shop. We're gonna serve the local community. The Pacific Northwest has a really vibrant NRL hunter and PRS you know, population, people that want high end hunting rifles, that sort of thing. Uh, and so, you know, that would be, that gives you actually some, some good freedoms. ATF isn't gonna be coming to your home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just took the Cerakote training and if you're a brick and mortar shop, you can display the certified Cerakote applicator sign, right? Yeah. You have to have a brick and mortar shop because that's what goes along with their business model. Another note on having a separate shop from your home mm -hmm. is it, it's nice to keep your business, the business firearms, mm -hmm. separate from personal firearms. Definitely. And when you have your home shop, yep. that can be kind of tricky sometimes. You're bringing yep. your guns in and it's getting all mixed around. Separate safes is what I've heard is yep. the way to go. This, these are my personal guns and these are my books guns. And so when the ATF comes, your books and your your customer safe will, will line up. Yep. And if it doesn't, you have a problem. Yep. Uh, Brick and mortar, one plus employee. So, you know, this could be everything from a gun shop with a gunsmith all the way up to uh, someone like Aero Precision, right? We've got hundreds of employees or 100 employees or 50, whatever that number is. And, you know, it, it, it's, there's a whole spectrum of different business opportunities. And it's likely that you'll incrementally work your way up towards that if that's your destination. Yeah. I know, you know, Bat Machine, for instance, they had a home shop until not too long ago. Now they have this huge, you're gonna to wanna to check out my shop tour over there. Uh, a, a big, huge shop, tons of CNC equipment in there and they have, you know, 10 or so employees and they're they're doing great business. But it, that's not an overnight thing, No, right? It's something to grow towards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about training. Okay. You gotta get your skills, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so as far as, so I come from the, the firearms school or the gunsmithing school side of the house. So I, I went to a brick and mortar gunsmithing school mm -hmm. based out of Lakewood, Colorado. And so I'm, I'm a proponent of that, of the getting your education, at least the initial education through some sort of uh, degree offering institution. A formal program. A formal program. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's where you learn the theory the theory of all platforms, right? You might, you're not, what we deal with a lot in the firearms industry, and I don't know if you, you've deal, dealt with this a lot, but when you're working the gun counter, you deal with this a lot, but a peop, people will come in and they have all the knowledge there is to know <laughs> about one platform. Yeah. And they'll destroy you on their, not, like they'll, you know, they'll, they can be combative. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. You know, yeah, about yeah. that one platform. <laughs> and if you don't know everything, they're, they're gonna cream you. 
But when you're, when you're going to a firearms or a gunsmithing school or a firearms technology school, you learn everything. Mm -hmm. Learn it, learn the theory behind all the platforms, not just, mm -hmm. you know, an a inch, inch wide and a mile deep, but you're going, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. the Mississippi River, you want that. Yep. So, um, so anyway, so that's one, in my opinion, that's the way to kind of get into it. Mm -hmm. And then you continue your education in other ways. And you've got at SDI the degree programs and their certificate programs. So the de degree programs are going to have everything with gen ed classes and electives and then your core courses. A certificate is going to be more fo focused. So, yeah. you know, kind of depends on where you want to go with that. Um, so, yeah, definitely accredited institution. I'm glad to be partnered with SDI now because I'm able to take some of this training. And for me, you know, I know a lot about precision rifles. I know uh, a good bit about machining. But beyond that, I'm looking forward to expanding that knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, and becoming more well-rounded. I took specialty training. So Gordy Gritters runs the Extreme Accuracy Institute. He is focused on laser precision rifles, right? Rifles that are going to break world records. Now, you don't have to want to do that to go to his class, but those are the skills specifically that he's going to teach you and show you one on one on six or so, right? It's not one on one, but you know, if you want to say, hey, how tight is that? You know, you can talk with him and he can show you, he can have you do certain things on a limited basis. And I'll tell you, it was, it was such a good experience, I want to do it again. Because you go the first time and it's like, okay, well, this is the process and, and, and then you go home and you do a bunch of it, right? And then you come back with more questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't be afraid to take training or watch videos or read books, you know, more than one time because it's going to definitely be an iterative pr process. So on that note, self-taught, you know, I went through the mechanical engineering program, learned to run lathes. I worked with grandpa on his lathe for a while, but really... I learned it end to end by reading How to Run a Lathe by South Bend. I happened to have a 10, a Model 10 at the time, mm -hmm. 10 by 24, and that was super helpful. They, they kind of walked through everything from cutting screw threads to feeds and speeds to, you know, what, what kind of cutting fluid should you use. And yes, it was 1930s, 1950s information, but you can always add on to that with current, you know, methods and tools. Well, a lot of those old guys, holy cow, they break us, they, they blow us out of the water. Yes. As far as what they were able to do, I'm always blown away mm -hmm. on not as precise tool, uh, uh, machines and everything. Mm -hmm. They're, they're light years ahead yeah. of what I was. So, yeah. So there's a whole lot to learn from that. And I think mm -hmm. just getting your hands dirty is so important. Definitely. Like not because because we can live too much in the theory world mm -hmm. and not the actual practical application. So you got to get in there and you got to get a mentor. I think it's, I had a mentor yes. when I first started into the, the firearms world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, when I knew nothing, I, I grew mm -hmm. up hunting with my dad, but at that point, firearms were just a tool. Mm -hmm. You pull it out of the closet, mm -hmm. you dust it off, and then you go and get something and you put it, you clean it and put it away. But when I was fi it's finally getting into the firearms world, I mm -hmm. had that mentor to take me under his wing and teach me everything. It was so important to have that. Totally invaluable. And here's what would really impress me if I had a candidate coming to me for a job in the gunsmithing industry would be a completely well-rounded portfolio. This person has a resume that outlines all their experiences and has all of their formal education outlined in a clear manner. Uh, this person has a portfolio, you know, video and photos and documentation uh, and, and maybe even like auction results or high profile customers and has all of that, you know, on LinkedIn as well, right? That's a, a great way to build your business network. So your, your portfolio and your network is kind of how this all gets solidified. And if you're able to do that, you will definitely rise up above 90% of the other people, you know, mm -hmm. looking for jobs. Yep. So here's another thing is what altitude do you want to fly at, mm -hmm. right? Do you want to be more of a generalist uh, or do you want to be more of a specialist? And there's definitely pros and cons on either side. Yeah, I think, I think that, I don't know, it's hard to stay in the generous, generalist world. Mm -hmm. Maybe professionally, professionally, it's easy to stay there, but there's always going to be a niche that's pulling you. 
Yes. There's always something that's going to pull you over that you really enjoy this aspect of gunsmithing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's checkering. Maybe that's something else, you know, but you, and, and maybe it's not lucrative. So you just mm -hmm. never go there. But yeah, so generalist, you're, you're looking at your, your um, regular cleaning, your, your general repairs. You're seeing, you know, grandpa's old 410 shotgun that he used. <laughs> you know, for 60 years in the swamps or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're seeing that and you're, you're just kind of just getting, taking in whatever you can. Right. And, and this would be a great skill set to have if you're a sole proprietor gun shop, you know, and people are going to bring in guns and maybe, maybe you buy them and fix them and then sell them again. Or you never know what a customer is going to ask. And maybe you don't have a machine shop and that's fine because you're going to be focused on, you know, refinishing and cleaning and troubleshooting and small repairs, you know, mm -hmm. a broken firing pin, order it for the customer, install it, boom. I would almost argue that this is good, just foundational knowledge to have, you know, well, not yeah. to go too deep. Well, and, and that also brings us back to why it's so important to have a network. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you know that machinist, mm -hmm. Well, you, then you, you give him the job, um, say it's $120 an hour for machining time that you're charging. Yep. Um, so you give him, you, he charges you $80, $80 or something like that. And so you have, you keep, you, you gave it to him to do the, the sure. uh, chambering. Sub it out. But you keep $40 of that. Yep. And so th those relationships, you might not need the machine shop. You just have those relationships. Yeah, you don't have to do everything. Yeah. Uh, I do like the specialist track. Again, I'm, I'm kind of on the precision rifle end of the spectrum. That's where, you know, a lot of my interest is, a lot of my knowledge is. Probably that, I would say, and the AR platform. Uh, and also hunting rifles. <laughs> yeah. but, but a lot of it has to do with precision. You know, that, that is kind of my niche and my specialty. And what I learned in even taking the Cerakote training was there are very specific business opportunities out there and I know if someone's waiting for a full custom rifle you know PRS rifle sometimes that that wait list I heard of one gunsmith here locally two years yeah so the there's definitely opportunity for people to come into these specialties and I think if you're able to fill your billable hours that is a, a definitely a way that you can make more money at this or even make it a living in general because gunsmiths some of them do struggle to make a living at this mm -hmm. and it's going to depend on where you're located i know where we're located things are just expensive in general you know well and that's where the internet comes in really handy mm -hmm. now you're not necessarily it's not a not local your, town right yeah it's you don't world. have to yeah it's the <laughs> world you you don't have to be confined into this yeah. one little location people yep. send you stuff or you ship things out and yep you, you can be broad yeah definitely and in, in the specialist side, uh, engraving and coatings work would definitely be another one to add there. So let's say you are starting your own gunsmithing shop. Here are some licensing things that I've gone through recently that I want to share that are most likely going to apply to you. So you've got all of your federal licensing, the FFL. I'll talk about the different types there, but you need to be a licensee. You have to have a federal firearms license. Uh, the special occupational tax, if you're going to be dealing with suppressors or machine guns, you know, that's definitely something that's going to need to be looked at. And, and then ITAR is a, a sort of a tack on to the SOT. You have to be registered with ITAR for the most part if you're a manufacturer, extra overhead, extra expense. <laughs> definitely non-trivial stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm in the state of Washington. I had to get a Washington business license, a Washington reseller's permit, a Washington firearms license, long guns, handguns, ammunition. I've got all of that. So lots of uh, waiting on a lot of this stuff too. And some of it, you got to get your location rented and then ap apply for your FFL because they need your business address, right? Oh, and you need your business license too. So when you go to apply for your FFL, there's a whole stack of paperwork, you know, and documentation, including for me, the county, uh, getting permission from the county to do business at this particular address. Can't be too close to a school. Can't yep. this, can't that. Which, depending on where you live, can be really difficult. It can be very difficult. <laughs> yeah. We, we actually dealt with that in a new office that we're, we uh, are renting 
for the school. Gotcha. For our FFL, we couldn't do it at our original office mm -hmm. because there's a school. Like, I mean, and so you have to you have to be very very specific on where you're going because yes. there's depending on the city, there's schools everywhere. Yeah. So. And is the zoning appropriate for a machine shop if a machine shop resembles what your business activity is? Lots lots to consider there. Uh, and then in terms of FFLs, there's two types that you're going to want to look at, either the 01 or the 07. 01 would be just a common dealer's license. So if you own a gun shop, this is likely going to be the one that you're going to have. And if you're doing gunsmithing for customers at their request, for the most part, that could potentially cover it, right? But if you're going to buy firearms and modify them and then sell them, or if you're doing anything with serial numbers, you know, that type of thing, or converting, uh, you know, when I do a machine gun that is a manufacturing entry and it is re-engraving the firearm with the FFL information and the serial number, then you definitely need a manufacturer's license. If you're going to be creating receivers from scratch or anything like that, my advice would be default to the 07. Yes, there's additional overhead and additional costs. If you make less than 500,000 in gross revenue, there's one fee schedule. If you make over 500,000 in revenue per year, there's it's about double the cost essentially. Yeah. So just go to atf.gov and you know read up on this stuff and talk to them. You know uh, when you apply for your FFL, you're going to get an agent in charge assigned to you. And I did a lot of back and forth on questions. And, and all that. This person was very cool to work with, uh, a firearms, you know, enthusiast herself. Yeah, and her I, husband. I think that that's experience. something to hit on too. Is a lot of us have a stigma of the ATF, and that they're the enemies, and they really aren't. Like yeah. the, everyone I've dealt with from the ATF mm -hmm. is there. They want you to succeed, and they, it, you know, they're coming in and they're helping you, you know, maybe fix little errors on your books mm -hmm. that you might have. So they call them, talk to them, yep. you know, talk to them about what you need to do yeah. for the FFL. Uh, my viewpoint on it personally is I'm subject to the rules that are there mm -hmm. and I'm running a business, right? So this isn't political advocacy in this sphere. It's I want to understand what I need to do and I want to know how to do it effectively. And it, it is confusing and there's a lot of learning curve there to read all of all of those regulations on a state level and a federal level. It's an intersection of the two there. Okay, so here I wanted to talk about what to charge because I hear about a lot of gunsmiths basically that are undercharging and are maybe going under or barely able to feed their family. And this is where some strategy is really important. So yep. the first thing you need to do is figure out what your income needs are. What do you need to make your goals? Your goals could be to get by, could be to get by plus save for retirement to, you know, whatever that is. Uh, and, and also keep in mind when you're building a business, you're building something of tremendous value. So it's not just the paycheck that you're going to pay yourself. It's at the end of five years, you might have a gunsmithing business that's worth a million dollars that you could sell to someone. They've got a jump start. They've got a customer base. That's really the way to think about it. Is it is definitely an investment if you build something of value. Yep. Which, yeah, that's. <laughs> I I can say I fell into that category when I owned my own business mm -hmm. at first. Is you you say well the rationale is well I can undercut the competition. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what at least my thought process was. You don't undercut the competition. You undervalue yourself. Yes. People people. You, if you if you charge a certain amount, then they expect you're going to be worth that, and then it's just up to you to put out the the work that shows that you're worth that. Yeah, and the good news is gunsmiths are becoming a more rare breed, and so really there's such a huge demand that demand is almost unfulfillable. Someone around here said you could have like a hundred custom rifle shops show up here in the Pacific Northwest, and they still wouldn't be able to to feed the demand at the rate that things are growing. Yeah. So. Uh, Definitely know your income needs, know your true operating costs. And this is something that is a little bit hard to quantify. This video should definitely help you quite a bit in that, uh, in that arena. Uh, your value proposition. You know, why are people giving you a call? A, you're local, that's part of your value. Uh, the specific services that you offer, the turnaround time that you offer, the special customer service, right? If you go and run a great business, you will succeed.
-hmm. because there just aren't that many truly great businesses out there. And like I said, the, the demand far outweighs the supply here. Uh, know the comp competitive rates on a national basis. Uh, if you're building custom rifles, people will start to ship them in from around the states and, and maybe beyond that as well. So know what the, the national rates are, know what local rates are. They may be higher or lower depending on the socioeconomic situation and the demographics around where you're at. A good resource for that is Brownells. They put out a list oh, of, very good. of fees that are, so they, they send out a survey to, mm -hmm. um, to gunsmiths and they, they ask them what they charge for specific jobs. And they have a whole list on their website. So if you look that up, you'll find those those fees and it gives you a range of fees. So you might be on the lower end of that range, but that gives you kind of a, a ballpark to start yeah. charging at. Yep, and I've, I've decided I'm only gonna do top quality work, right? So we indicate the barrels down to about one ten thousandth of an inch of run out on the mm -hmm. grooves and we get two points of reference and basically the Gordy Gritters model. So when we do a chambering job, it's gonna be more like five to $600, depending on your options. Like, is the muzzle threaded, right? Do we, do we do a thread protector and that kind of stuff? And I was talking to someone else in the industry and they said, well, someone else can do it for 350. I said, then go for it. But yeah. you know, it's, it's not gonna be the same quality. And that's why I think that specialty mentality and doing top quality work is gonna treat you well because you're gonna be able to charge more per hour and time is money, obviously. Uh, so the outcomes, uh, definitely charge enough. Do not be afraid to charge what it's worth. And that might sound like a lot, especially initially. But if you're doing top quality work, you will find people that will pay for it and we'll get to marketing in it. <laughs> well, you bit, could have, right? so it's do a you cycle. Want, yeah, do you want to fill your time up with three guns or one gun? I'd rather yep. just do one gun and get paid for it. Yep. And I'm not having to soak up all my time with those three. Absolutely. So. Yeah. So you might you might lose customers because they like, "Oh, I don't want to pay that." Well, you know, you can go somewhere else and I'll yep. take the one gun that's yep. actually going to pay me what I'm worth. So, another outcome is to not focus on the competition, but to focus on you and your business and what you bring to the picture and marketing that business. Don't worry about people that are doing substandard works, charging substandard prices. That's not a viable model and you don't have to compete with them. Mm -hmm. uh, refine your product offerings based on what's hot and what people want, like even in, within Precision Rifle, which standard chamberings are we gonna offer? Are we gonna do the 6GT and the Dasher? and the six Creedmoor, right? There, it's, and the six by 47. Um, it helps to have a more scoped approach, right? But then also to make sure you're able to fulfill all that people currently want, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, and then continued education, skilling up and, and tooling up. You know, We're looking at a machine to cut custom foam inserts for rifle cases, because that's how we want to deliver them. We might spend seven grand on that to do it in-house because we know we're gonna do it long-term. Uh, or we might find someone locally that we can just farm that work out to. You know, those are all, the tooling is, is constantly things that we're looking at. Okay, so business location wise, I just went through this exercise, right? You're gonna be looking at things like rent. I looked at what's the cost per square foot. And in our town, it was about a dollar per square foot. I'm paying just under that. And uh, it's at a location next to a bridge that just got opened with major traffic, you know? so. Are you in a place that people can get to? Are you in a place where people can park? Uh, is it visible from the road? Can you put up a big sign? Uh, we already talked about schools and zoning. It, very, very important. Uh, here you might have rural residential and need a conditional use permit if you do it from your own property. Six month process may not go through, right? Mm -hmm. Super important stuff. Uh, the whole rent versus buy thing, I wish I could have bought the building that I'm in because it was a good deal. And that would be, it has a, an accessory residential unit next to it, that's extra rent money. Uh, but I decided uh, it's better for me to not have to think about all that. I just, I just wanna sign a two year lease and just, just, just move in and not have to worry about financing or you know, escrow or Well, you might find that like the that. location isn't the greatest and then you want to yeah. move somewhere else. Well, so. what's likely is eventually we're going to need more space. So mm -hmm. that's a, a, a big thing there. And then shipping and receiving, you know, the that's our biggest pain point right now because we're staffing up the shop and having people there to, to, to do that. Uh, the different carriers, there's all sorts of stuff I could go into there. It's 
very specific with firearms, and that's just you know how close you are to UPS and FedEx and your USPS. Fortunately, we have a post office nearby, and actually the USPS is one of the better way to ship firearms because they'll actually do it mm -hmm. without a whole lot of extra gobbledygook on the top of that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about insurance, and we're going to talk about payment processing. The bad news is nobody wants to insure you, and nobody wants to do firearms transactions. Asterisk. The asterisk is there are some companies out there that actually want this legitimate business, which is the good news. The bad news is it's a little bit difficult to find. So firearms insurance, it's specialized and expensive. Um, it's best to work with companies that know the firearms industry. I'm talking with Locked In Affinity. Right now I'll have more information on that in a little bit. Uh, as your business evolves, your revenue, all of your assets, these are rolling things that you're going to have to have discussions with and policy additions, you know, over time. It's a huge pain, but uh, you want to make sure that if your place burned down or if it was broken into and all your guns were stolen, that you had some recourse, definitely. Um, and when you get insurance, your company is going to want to know things like what kind of security system do you have? Do you have surveillance? How far are you from the fire station? How far are you from the police department? And those are all things that go to their actuarials and will be used to calculate your rates. So with payment processing and record keeping, this is a whole nother just sort of set of things to think about and is also sticky. So on the payment side, like I mentioned, banks don't want to get involved with firearms, uh, e-commerce platforms, credit card processors. I'm right now talking with Payrock. Uh, as I'm getting started about the credit card processing. I've learned a lot. There's a reason that they charge 3%, right? There's a lot of liability with things like chargebacks. But having credit card processing set up for your business is one of the indicators that you're legit, right? Mm -hmm. People have confidence to use their card because they know if there's a problem, they can go to that card company and they can do something about it. But that 3% is something that you have to expect and charge for. And my mentality is, I'm just gonna assume everybody's gonna pay with a card, and mentally I have to tack that on to my pricing structure. Because mm -hmm. yeah. if you don't, I mean, basically the person paying needs to pay for that. And it's just a thing now. You just gotta suck it up and just decide to take that hit, you know? Um, E-commerce platforms. So we've used Shopify online through the website to sell t-shirts. You can go to Shopify or go to Ultimate Reloader and you know buy a T-shirt. They're not going to get involved with firearms transactions because they hate you. No, <laughs> because politically it's a hot button topic, right? And so there are Authorize.net is one of the options. I'll have more information on this. Uh, I'm still putting together the the website for Rifles.UltimateReloader.com. It's important to do your research too before doing that because I was actually selling firearms courses online. Mm -hmm. going going gangbusters with it, selling a lot of courses, making good money. And then all of a sudden we got dropped by yep. the person that we were uh, going yep. through. And then it made us have to go through, try to find a new, a new what, what do you, would you call it, a, another platform for yeah. the transaction? Yeah, e-commerce platform. Uh, yep. It was a pain. I and we to, lost a bunch of money. Yeah, Pete Milan from Impact Shooting in South Africa had this problem with PayPal or something like that where he had like five grand that he just was locked up. And I don't know if he ever got it back. Mm -hmm. Kind of unfortunate. Uh, so on the other side, with all this, you know, electronic platform stuff, is what are you going to do with your A and D records? Your A and D records are your acquisition and disposition books. I decided to start with paper, so I have three sets of books: one for general firearms transactions, one for manufacturing, and one for our NFA items. So all of our suppressors, when they come into the shop, form three, dealer to dealer transfer, goes into that book. If I get a gun in that we're going to review or whatever, and it's in, in our inventory but not assigned to a person, it goes into the general books. Now all this can be done electronically, and that is where we're going to go to. Uh, a gunsmith needs work order tracking, mm -hmm. right? What jobs are in the queue, where, what state are they in, and all that, and what are the corresponding A&D records. If the customer's not there while you wait, you're going to need to add an acquisition record. Now it's on your books, right? And then when the customer picks it up, there's a disposition record. Uh, to be able to do all that electronically means you're going to be able to search, and there's a lot of great benefits there. But the downside is if the ATF comes and there's some sort of computer glitch, uh, 
you do not want to be in that position. Well, and that's where it's good to just print them out as you're going. Yes. Print the pages out, keep a physical copy somewhere. Yep. But I'll tell you from experience, the electronic version is really nice mm -hmm. because they have the fields. You just fill them all out. It organizes it where it needs that information yep. to go. You're not having to, if, if you're not having to cross things out and then put your initials next to it and do all that stuff and it looks messy yeah. in, a, in a printed version <laughs> versus you could just delete that and then, and then put in the pertinent information you need. Mm -hmm. So I do like the electronic version. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if you can get one. And forcing ourselves to start with paper forces us to understand every aspect of it yeah. from manual to automatic. Kind of like starting on a manual layer and then learning CNC, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, with all that out of the way, let's talk about, you know, you're building a shop from scratch. What all do you need to buy? There's, there can be a really big list here, you know. If you're doing general repair, again, the, the, the workbench and some, some basic hand tools might be enough to get you started. Yeah. But let's talk about a, a shop where you're going to be doing like laser engraving and machining, you know, and that. Uh, the machinery itself, this is a total mild to wild kind of thing. I started with a lathe I think I paid $1,000 for, and I've got a 16 by 60 Precision Matthews here. You know, this is around twenty thousand dollars, twenty-five maybe, with your DRO and all your tools and all that. This machine is very solid, and very rigid, and a lot of capacity. This is really what you'd want for manual machining. But if you don't have that kind of credit or that kind of money to spend on it, you could get a used machine or you could get a smaller machine. A lot of jobs that you can do with limited machinery. Yeah, you just have to ask yourself what what jobs are you well. That's knowing the future. That's, that's well, not knowing the future, but looking into the future, right? Yeah. Of saying, where do I want to go and where am I right now? Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, you might just start with a, a bench, a little toolbox with your simple cleaning and, and uh, repairing tools mm -hmm. that you need, and maybe an ultrasonic cleaner, something like that. Yep. And that's all you have. You, you get that income because if you put that big check out at first, are you ever going to make that up? Yeah. With the jobs, with the work that you're going to do, are you ever going to uh, make enough income to to uh, recuperate that? Yeah, that cost? and you could yeah. think of it as long-term recuperation, or even your monthly payments if you're using credit, you know, to buy this stuff. Things to think about. But uh, you know, with the drill press and a small lathe, that's enough to get started. And you know what? You're going to want that drill press and small lathe as secondary equipment once you get your milling machine and your bigger lathe and maybe CNC. Uh, also, a metal cutting bandsaw. Uh, you're gonna probably want buffers and grinders and polishers, things you can kind of build up, you know, yep. over time. In terms of tools, uh, definitely the precision measurement is a really important part. Uh, quality matters here, so your Starrett or your Mitutoyo is gonna be a really good investment that's gonna pay dividends. Electronic is really good because you can zero things out, get incremental tolerances and measurements and that kind of thing. Uh, a so little, bit, little bit more precision, too, yeah, on definitely. some of those digitals. Below a tenth, right, yeah. of, of a thousandth of an inch. So workspace and fixtures and equipment, you you got your specialty vices, you've got your workbench, you've got you know, your padding so you don't scratch your, your firearms and your toolboxes. I mean, there, there's a ton of stuff. And again, start small and, and build it up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we all have that dream. Right. We all have that, that want <laughs> list. You just have to separate it yep. into what is actually manageable. Yep. Lots of different marking technologies. I started out with just the stamps used with a hammer. And, and they look crooked. And they can, definitely. Yeah. I did a three upside down one time and I just it was not on a critical <laughs> thing, but I'm like, oh man. Yeah. Uh, now I have a 50 watt fiber laser with a rotary unit. That was a $6,500 investment. But I decided I want my rifles to look professional. Every barrel that goes through the shop is going to get laser engraved with the twist rate and the length and the manufacturer. And then now that I have an 07, I need it for marking things when I do serialize, you know, lowers or receivers or whatever. Uh, on the technology side, obviously you've got computers and printers and barcode scanners and, and, and all the rest. Uh, <laughs> even a fax machine, as funny as that sounds, our local police department when you're doing a handgun, transfer requires a faxing solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might yeah. go with a cloud one, who knows. Uh, record keeping, we mentioned uh, electronic books and, and paper books, and you might want to have an inventory system. Uh, storage is a big thing. 
you know, we're building a secure room and we've got two gun safes in there and that's not gonna be enough, right? And then there's all the security implications around that. That's when you actually <laughs> might think about the actual vault. Yes. So building a cinder block vault with a, a safe door. Yep, and absolutely. Have a lot of space in there. Because as a gunsmith, it's not gonna be practical to throw everything inside a gunsmith, uh, a gun safe. You're gonna want a secure room if you can, yep. if you can build one. Yeah, the security and surveillance piece, so there's a monthly aspect to that. There's an upfront equipment cost and installation cost on that. You know, and then there's all, all the other capabilities. I'm building a Cerakote booth, and that involves a specialty space, involves ventilation and filtration. You know, you've got flammable liquids that you've got in there with the acetone and, and mm -hmm. all sorts of equipment with air dryers and compressors, <laughs> you know. Uh, fortunately, I had a lot of that already, but... Uh, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you can take lightly if you want to do it right. I decided I've done enough paint jobs outdoors or you know I didn't want to build a gunsmith Cerakote oven. So it's, it's a big investment. But, but again, you might have another shop you can farm that out to yep. and, and be able to charge a bit of a cut. So this is some of the things, if you have something that you want to add, drop a comment. Uh, in terms of employees, there's contract employees and then there's W-2 employees that are subject to tax withholdings and, and all the other things that go along with that, uh, of the accounting overhead that you're gonna have, right? Uh, it is difficult to find qualified candidates, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, just know that if you have a W-2 employee, which may be an important part of an FFL, you know, a bona fide employee is somebody that can take your gun and go and test it off site. Uh, someone, you know, that has the ability to work under that FFL, you know? someone that is a, a, a qualified person. And that can bring 15 to 25% overhead easily. It can go up to 50%. You know, once you talk about uh, your benefits and you know, vacation time and then all those federal and state things that you've got to do, it's a big thing. Well, and not to dig too much into the weeds on, the, <laughs> on politics right now, but with everything shifting, things are changing as far as like, Minimal, minimum wage and oh, all yeah. this that can really cut into profits. Mandatory breaks. And, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so. then you got to think about OSHA and L&I and, and all that stuff. Yep. So uh, also the marketing aspect, right? You're starting something new. That's what this is, video is about. And all too often people don't effectively market their businesses. Now, if you have enough referral uh, business, that might not be an issue. So some people can get away without effective marketing, because inherently they've got their customer base. But you should have a plan. Uh, you should put your business on Google Maps. Make sure that your store hours are there, the description, the category, the name of your business, uh, your phone number, all of that stuff. Because a lot of businesses, especially in small towns, they don't go and do that, and that means it's hard to find you and hard to do business with you. Build a great website, have a search engine optimization strategy, you know, having your own blog can help with that, with special tags, you know, firearms, gunsmithing, shotguns, whatever it is that you're into. That, cutting in, like, <laughs> that, like, you have more experience, well, you have probably better experience, but I'll tell you from my end, when I was marketing the classes, our, our firearms course, mm -hmm. courses we were doing, um, on a, you know, at a different job, and at my own business, it was exhausting. That was, yeah. that was probably the thing that took up most of my time is the marketing as far as SEO optimization mm -hmm. or as, you know, like getting those keywords and you're kind of constantly changing it and tweaking it. Yep. And then, and then social media. I'm not a natural born social media person. Mm -hmm. So Facebook and all these, mm -hmm. Instagram and stuff, that it was, is really, really difficult for me to do. It is, and don't feel like you have to do everything, right? Getting your business on Google Maps and into Google is a fundamental. You just, you just need to do that. Having your website set up, making sure that you show up in search results in some meaningful way is great. Social media can be one of those things where if you start it, it's like starting a garden and you never water it, it's just a dead garden and nobody wants that. Consider outsourcing this work as well. Mm -hmm. Whether it be a local high school kid that's into what you do, that can work with your stuff, that knows all the latest emojis yeah, 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 yeah. and hashtags and all that kind of stuff. Um, or if you're a larger operation, definitely outsourcing that to an agency can make a lot of sense because that is what they do, right? Uh, a newsletter is a great thing. 
to email people and to have promotions and stuff like that. Uh, lots of different channels between social media, the web, and some of these other, you know, you can get on the Better Business Bureau, all sorts of opportunities there for people to find you and to evaluate what you do. But for marketing, uh, the most successful businesses uh, dedicate about seven to eight percent of their gross revenue to marketing. Sounds like a lot, but remember that's going to make you a lot more than that in return. Yep. yep. Okay, now how to run a business. Now I know the SDI has course coverage on this. This is the biggest thing. Again, if you're the best gunsmith in the world, but you don't know how to run an effective business, you will likely fail. And we don't want you to do that. So know about business finance, how much to do out of pocket, how much to borrow, you know, what kind of assets you're gonna need, what kind of credit that you're gonna need. Uh, project management and accounting, super, super important stuff. If you don't know where your money is going, you can't optimize it, you know. If you can't keep track of the rifles that are in your shop, and have start and stop dates and, and turn around and good communication, you're, you're definitely gonna really, really struggle. And then management and people. If you have employees, you know, you're gonna need to know how to be an effective leader and how to train people and how to retain top talent. That's probably one of the hardest things. Uh, so expectations and timeline. We've talked about how long it takes to start a business just to go through uh, finding a location and getting your business license, getting your FFL, I mean, you can plan on six months easily. Uh, I've taken it more slow because that's fine. We're using the, this business location for a lot of things. Uh, but, you know, who can afford to be without an income for that long? Something that you have to plan for, definitely. Uh, creativity and flexibility, you got to change with the times, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You got to... Well, and that's why where social media comes in. Mm -hmm. You keep up on that and you know where it's going, yeah. right? If you're creative in your marketing, right, uh, come in for barrel chambering and then the second one is 20% off. Oh, yeah. I, we have a lot of people on our wait list that want two or three or four barrels done, mm -hmm. right? Think about how you can offer the best deal and entice people to do business with you. Um, yeah, confidence in adversity. It's not going to be easy. Running your own business is the harder path. It can be the more rewarding path for the right, you know, mentality and the right person. Know yourself, you know. If, if you're not cut out to run your own business and you're cut out to go and work for someone else, by all means do that. Um, and then focus, diligence, communication, follow through. You just have to be so, you know, able to do the, all those things. Yeah, and before we leave this slide, I just want to mention having the understanding of how to keep a passion, how to keep your passion mm -hmm. alive. Because mm -hmm. you you might do this so much that you end up hating it. <laughs> I had a friend who was well, it was my my friend's dad, my best friend's dad, but he was talking to me when he when I was younger. He's like, mm -hmm. Rick, don't ever make your passion your career. <laughs> well, I've done that, me and too. it's still a passion for me. Me too. Yeah. But there were, there have been times where it can be get, get tedious, and yeah. so you have to keep that alive. Take some breaks. Take some, you know, don't don't go to the grindstone and just kill yourself over it. So, I think that's like I know myself, and I know I need variety, and I've never been more passionate about firearms ever, mm -hmm. and I'm as deep and far into this as I've ever been, and I think that's just an indicator that I'm headed in the right direction. Now I'm overwhelmed trying to find people to work for me down at the store and you know, new things to take on and all these things that we've been talking about. But I know I'm in the right place, you know, and, and that's, that's the thing to think about. And if you're the kind of person that just likes to do that same thing and do it really well, there's, that's a great thing, you know, and that's where a trade can be a great thing or, you know, doing that sort of fixed function. But being a business owner will give you a variety and that's a good thing. Okay, so in summary, uh, start with the education. Make sure that you have good skills. Uh, align with demand. Make sure it's kind of like getting a degree, right? Mm -hmm. I would never recommend someone go just get a degree. I view it from find the job market you want to target, and then align your degree to that job market, right? Well, and that's <laughs> where that's where places like SDI come in handy because in the bachelor's and master's degrees, mm -hmm. I had really good professors mm -hmm. um, that were patient with me, but I probably drove them nuts at how. Every assignment had to deal with firearms, at least the assignments <laughs> I could choose, yeah. everything. My thesis was on how to improve uh, 
law enforcement training. Oh, um, very cool. In force on force and, and mm -hmm. use of force. So, but specifically use of deadly force with firearms. Mm -hmm. And so, but and that's my thesis. That's my master's degree. My professor's like, oh my gosh, this guy. But but that's the thing is like, it, 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 with a with a course like SDI, you can at least get a degree in it, get educated in mm -hmm. people that you're not going to drive crazy. Yeah. Talking about firearms all the time. Yeah, so. and within the industry, there's so many different opportunities, you know, and things are constantly changing. So yeah, check out the opportunity and then, you know, kind of form your business model or your career, you know, based around that. Do outstanding work, right? That's always going to treat you well. If you do outstanding work, you will succeed. Uh, I wish I could hire more people that do outstanding work. Hard to find those people. Uh, charge enough to make your goals. Charge enough to make what you deserve to make and don't worry about the competition. Cover all your bases. Legal, liability, ATF, right, insurance, all that stuff. Uh, those are all things you need to think about and things that will help you sleep at night. Market your business. <laughs> this is something that is a struggle, it's its whole thing, but there's some simple things that you can do, cover those basic bases, and then evolve over time. So, Rick, thank you very much for coming. Yeah. This yeah. has been super experience, and if you are interested in training and you wanna do it remotely, SDI is a great option. Go to sdi.edu, you can check out their courses there, mm -hmm. the degree program, the certificate program, and if you wanna talk to someone, call 480-999 four seven six seven please share your thoughts also we've covered a lot in this video we'd love to hear what you have to say about what you want to do or your experiences getting to where you've gotten to that concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up i hope you enjoyed this video don't forget to like and subscribe also we're on facebook youtube rumble where we've got unrestricted content and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're going to want to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you're interested in becoming a professional gunsmith, check out the Sonoran Desert Institute. They've got a degree program, they've got a certificate program, and you can study from home. Learn more at sdi.edu. Thanks again for watching.